It seems even animals aren't spared in that tussle between tradition and the Supreme Court's <coughs> decisions and, of course, legality of such uh, customs in the country. Joining me right now in the studio are Gauri Moleki, she's an animal rights activist, and N.G. Jaisima, who's a lawyer and a member of the Animal Welfare Board of India. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining you. us here. In my first question to you is, I don't even understand how an event like this is still continuing to take place. We are in 2016, after all. What exactly are we looking at? Is this tradition? Is like the package it mentioned right now? Or is this just some sort of volatile attempt to hold on to something that nobody wants to really look at the legalities of or understand really animal rights in all of this? I'll come to you first. Okay, now where uh, the roots of such events lie in ancient agricultural traditions perhaps, you know, where uh, bulls were tamed or whatever, at a very rural, local level without cruelty as such, a as the way we see it now, uh, it's the whole commercial aspect uh, that has been given to the sport and uh, the gambling that goes with it and the politicizing of the whole thing that has led to this obnoxious, you know, uh, cruelty event. I wouldn't even call it a sport anymore. Right. Um, that it has now come to be, uh, which is uh, offensive to any civilized uh, society. Uh, this is not just one. Jallikat is limited to certain districts of Tamil Nadu. But there are various other sports such as the bull racing in Maharashtra which is so common and it is grotesque as much as Jallikat. Right. There is Kambala in Karnataka and various other sports in which bovines which are essentially farm animals, slow animals, they are not really meant for running or racing of any kind but they are tortured into you know, in a, in a into a panic-stricken state right. where they're running for the, for their life, and uh, it certainly has no place in law. Although the law, we agree, is very weak, but it does not d allow any such event to be held. Um, even under the constitution, it is um, you know completely offensive to uh, the spirit of ahimsa uh, which India upholds, and um, the Supreme Court has thereby uh, stood and uh, you know against it. Right. So we will talk more about the law and the amendments that really are needed to that. But Jaya, you know, if in continuation to what Gauri just said, it's not just, uh, it seems, the the court actually said that. It said that the, the TNRG or the Tamil Nadu regulation of uh, Jalikatta is anthropocentric. It's focused on humans and not on animals. Do you agree with that? And, and why hasn't Maharashtra sort of, because Maharashtra was also, uh, you know, banned from allowing this to take place. How come Maharashtra hasn't spoken up, but Tamil Nadu has? has spoken up. I, I Maharashtra has spoken up. Goa for a long period of time has been trying to legalize bull fights. Uh, there are buffalo fights that happen in Assam. There are bull bull bird fights that has, I mean, happen in Assam. Cockfighting is common in Andhra Pradesh. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you must understand this entire thing is a pure political rhetoric to get votes, right? When development is not on the agenda, when you want to try and get votes on this inflated sense of nationalism, which is somehow confused with these old tradition, uh, you kind of push for these to be legalized and kind of keep people confused over this age old debates rather than looking at getting roads, education, food, right. all of those kind of issues, right? So but the fact really <coughs> is that the normal common person in Tamil Nadu or Maharashtra does not really want this sport. What he really needs is development, what he really needs is school and employment. But the political parties are trying to draw mileage out of this entire thing. The only reason why this was legalized last year was because the Tamil Nadu election was there. The only reason it was done in Maharashtra because the then minister came from Maharashtra and he went ahead and made some promises in his constituency. So we need to look beyond the political rhetoric. The common person on the street does not want to be doing this. He does right. not want to be doing this. It, everybody is appalled and horrified by what we see. But sadly, political rhetoric kind of overtakes common sense and also the Supreme Court in this country, which is really sad. And clearly, it's a very lucrative venture because we're looking at businesses. And that is perhaps why people will allow it to continue also because it may be a source of income for certain people. But what are the really the main problems that activists are encountering in keeping this practice banned? Well, right now, um, the Ministry of Environment and Forest has moved uh, in a certain direction which is uh, uh, which seems to be at uh, at this stage 
against the will of the Supreme Court uh, right. in a roundabout manner. Uh, it is still under consideration and we are hoping that they would, uh, you know, keep the law as it is uh, rather than, you know, finding a roundabout way which will again get slapped down by the Supreme Court because it is uh, not allowed. However, uh, if we remove, uh, you know, the restriction, the government removes the restriction, there is no way uh, the, the sport can still take place because finally uh, the constitution above its all is there and uh, the 2014 judgment of the Supreme Court is based more on the constitution than Done. any local law. Right. All right. So, that's Just to add to this entire thing, right, as in the idea of regulation was tried in the Tamil Nadu uh, Jalikatu Regulation Act, right? It wasn't that the court one fine day woke up and said we are going to prohibit it. Right. This matter started in the Madurai High Court and went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of India said that let's try and regulate it. There was an act that was brought in to regulate it. The Supreme Court appointed people to go and look at it. Based on those reports is when the Supreme Court said, well, it's impossible to kind of hold these things. The other part is that culture is kind of always used. But then culture has to be something that's dynamic and evolving, right? Once you start allowing it's allowing something on the basis of culture, then it's a slippery slope. Right. Uh, would you then move towards snake charming? What about bear dancing? What about uh, having wild Monkey. animals in circles? Child marriage for that Child matter. Marriage for I mean, that's what the Supreme Court judge asked. Absolutely. Right? I mean, yeah, she, yeah. He, the was, judgment actually mentions the fact that if there is a practice in a certain culture, you can't ignore context. Right. And I suppose that is what's going on. But beyond the uh, the regulation act so far mm -hmm. as jelly cutter goes what about the prevention of cruelty act now that is a, a something with a larger scope that's right and uh, but is it effective uh, legislature gori or is it really in need of dire review at this stage well the prevention of cruelty to animals act was enacted in 1960 now at that time the penalties were rupees 50 and rupees 100 in the range of that and uh, at that, uh, in 1960, 50 and 100 were reasonable sums. Right. So uh, the act was, uh, you know, made with a good intent. Uh, however, the, uh, the provisions were not cognizable and uh, they remained uncognizable. You could, for, uh, you know, file a non-NCR report. However, now that the, we've become a little more civilized and we have started recognizing cruelty as an aberration. Right. We've started recognizing that, you know, being cruel to animals indicates a certain psychopathic tendency or perhaps, you know, is indicative of various other problems. Uh, so we need to stop it effectively, which we are unable to because the penalties at this moment have become ridiculous. Right. 50 rupees is basically nothing. People would spend more than that to take in uh, a taxi and go to court. Absolutely. So uh, now the act should have been amended and the penalties should have been revised. It's not been done, although there's also been a private member's bill moved uh, for this specific purpose. Um, it's under consideration and as we know now, uh, the ministry has decided to, believe it or not, double the amount. So, right. <laughs> uh, from 50, it will become 100, right. and from 100, it will become 200. Right. So, which is uh, just as ridiculous, if not more, uh, but... Um, it's uh, almost offensive. Um, it, it is, is it offensive, is. yes. And, and at this time, uh, yesterday, for instance, a dog was uh, raped in Hyderabad yes. and killed. Um, uh, that kind of a crime... Uh, and the, imagine the perpetrator of that crime slapping a 50 rupees uh, on, on the magistrate's face and walking out. Um, how, how do we feel as Indians uh, to, after such a you know, ridiculous event? Right. Uh, there are illegal slaughterhouses running that you know, pay much more than that as bribes only to get away with it. Uh, there is any kind of cruelty taking place in India which we are unable to stop and it's not just cruelty to animals, we're saying forget about cruelty to animals. This is actually causing our environment to degrade, right. this is causing a whole lot of organized crime to get together, the Bangladesh cattle trafficking, the entire northern Indian cattle is moving towards Bangladesh, we cannot stop them because transport offenses again are 50 rupees, just worth 50 rupees. Right. So how do you stop? organized crime how do you organize all this money coming into illegal money falling into the hands of wrong people which they are uh, getting by being cruel to animals and we're not talking about isolated incidents these are huge rackets
So no, it's not it's not crime. really a review then that's required. It's it an entire it? refurbishment it's an of an the eye act. Wash. It is an absolute eye wash, and we are appalled by what the ministry has proposed as of date. I'm glad you brought up that incident from Hyderabad because I think uh, you know, in addition to talking about this uh, practice and what you're calling really can't be called a sporting event anymore. There's also all these domestic animals that somehow fall under the scanner because everyone seems to be concentrating on you know wildlife right. so there's the tigers there's lions so the the larger the animal really it seems like the more concentration but what about <coughs> domestic animals for for those of our viewers who are tu tuning in and don't really have an idea of right. the kind of laws that are around to protect them are there really any efficient laws protecting domestic animals right so the only law that protects domestic and wild animals from cruelty, from a pure cruelty point of view, is the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And it was written in 1960, and as right. Gauri said, the penal permissions have never been updated. The Wildlife Protection Act exists, but then that's for more on a conservation and preserving against hunting, but it isn't for, if somebody has a legal ownership of an animal and if he's cruel to the wild animal, he would still be under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act and not under the Wildlife Protection Act. The second thing is that most of these government officers who sit and write these bills and say doubling it is all right, every single time there's an inflation, their dearness allowance increases and they get inflation corrected salaries. And uh, they don't seem to understand what inflation correction when it comes to increasing penalty, which is a shame. Now, uh, the problem really with domestic animals is that two aspects. One is the street dogs and the animals who are on the street. And even in that, other than dogs, most of these other animals are animals that we raise for food. Right. For example, it could be the cows who are on the street, mm -hmm. who basically are tabelas who throw them out. Or it could be 220 million egg-laying hens in our country who are confined in battery cages where they're given less than an A4 size sheet of paper space for their entire life. Majority of the animals, uh, birds who are killed for like chicken, the broiler birds, they are uh, trade selected to put on body weight in 45 days, what they would take over a year. Most of them have multiple fractures. They can't even stand because they can't bear their own body weight. Similarly with fish and aquaculture, we factory farm them. We basically have taken these sentient beings and converted everything with relation to feed conversion. And when it comes to cattle on the street, illegal smuggling, Everything is coming down to the fact because we've changed our entire agriculture system where animal was an integral part of it to making it into seem like this industrialized animal agriculture where all it matters is feed conversion ratio. What's the feed you're getting? What's the input that you're getting? If it doesn't make sense, let it set it so to It's slaughter. complete commodification. It's complete commodification. And the idea <coughs> that an animal is sentient is gone. Jelly cutter is also commodification. As in, I've been to many jelly cutter events myself. There's huge amount of betting. The prices are high. If you look into the t-shirts, you'll see political parties supporting. Uh, you know, you'll have people wearing political party symbols, uh, you know, leaders photograph right. on their t-shirts. So everything is purely commodified. It's money. There's no culture. There is no you know, idea of food security or whatever. Finally, it all boils down to money and the very few people who are making money and using culture and everything to just like eye wash to the larger public and that's the problem. So it's a nexus of unaudited money, yeah. uh, politics, power, all of that. Yeah. In terms of what more can be done, now relying on legislature perhaps is not the only thing that uh, you know can be done. But do you think as a society, we've also, like you're saying, we have agrarian roots in this country, but along the way somehow uh, you know, the rigmaroles of everyday life have sort of made us perhaps less sensitive to animals. And that That's is right. something that needs to be inculcated perhaps at a more uh, you know, school level to yeah. children. I think uh, the saying goes no, that evil persists only when good people do nothing. Right. You know, most people, most Indians would be appalled at such practices. Even if they knew where their meat is coming from, perhaps they wouldn't eat. But then, you know, we just choose not to look at it. We mm -hmm. just choose to ignore it. Or if we watch it on television, we say, okay, somebody is looking after it. We don't need to do a thing. Right. Uh, well, um, we must appeal to everyone <laughs> who who is watching this to speak up this way or that let us hear every voice and then maybe uh, you know we'll have a right. better sense of what india thinks about this because um, right now the laws are archaic the uh, the cruelty is at its zenith mm -hmm. and it's only hurting us we can forget about animals and we can forget about animal welfare but we have to think about our our ecology right. we have to think about our children's future 
and uh, we are leaving a filthy, dirty, polluted planet for them. Right. And uh, we need to change this. We need to speak up. We need to appeal to the government of India to change the law, to update the law, not just you know, uh, make a make an eye wash thing of, of making fifty rupees hundred, but actually make it effective to make the offences cognizable. Right. To actually, uh, you know, train and create a system of implementation of this law, because otherwise, uh, it's just a few handful activists, and if they if they get offended by what they see, and and if they do something, then they are termed as gorakshaks and what God not. knows what all, mm -hmm. and they are targeted in turn. Right. And and believe it or not, it is actually the 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 organized crime, uh, the perpetrators of organized crime that are behind, uh, you know, labeling of such kind of gorakshak labeling and whatever. Because these are the few voices that we hear uh, in the country to actually who actually get offen offended to the extent that they take the trouble to stop it themselves. Right. It's frustrating in the country as of now to uh, fight against any animal crime, organized or otherwise, um, because uh, the penalties are ridiculous, the police is not trained, they're not even, most of the states are not even aware of this act. In fact, some people might even find it humorous that you're standing yes, they, up for the they rights. they do, trust of, me, they, they do. do. And, you know, I encounter it very often uh, because the other, you know, I think we, we're going to run out of time, there's so much to talk about, but for instance, uh, you know, the kinds of breeds being imported into this country, dog breeds, you yeah. know, so I keep getting into these run-ins with neighbors about, you know, St. Bernard's and, that's and right. Right. you know this heat but on the other side there's also this new phenomenon that's taken off and uh, that is of the social media public shaming of people who you know carry out crimes towards animals just recently there was a case in Bombay right. where you know somebody ran over a dog on purpose and somebody caught it on video so is that in some ways showing that there is a s slight change in attitude perhaps where people are finding ways to sort of raise their voices against such cruelty and perhaps the only way of doing it is to use whatever medium perhaps That's that right. you have. Right. We are grateful to the media and to whatever social media uh, you know is available to, to people to to raise their to concerns right. you know uh, but still we we do need that we do need a very powerful uh, you know voice coming out of the people reaching right up to the government of india and we're hoping that uh, the new uh, minister of, of state for uh, ministry of environment and forest takes very concrete steps to correct this because that's really what's going to be there's a needed. hashtag no it more it comes 50. down to him right. mm. there's a hashtag no more 50 <coughs> you can use that to tweet uh, people should definitely give feedback to monkey bath the prime minister is listening uh, so tweet him out, write to him, he is listening. And most importantly, I think when it comes to social media, it's a double-edged sword. We've seen that at some point of time, there's also a fetish beat with relation to the guy who uploaded something on Snapchat. So it's a double-edged sword, but when you see cruelty, speak up. I think right. that's the most important thing. And nowadays, you have a government who is receptive, who is listening. I think uh, all the viewers who are looking at it, they should hashtag uh, no more 50 uh, tag the Prime Minister, write to Man Ki Baat, ask and say that, you know, the problem is that animals don't vote. Right. And hence, uh, there is really nobody to speak up to them. And uh, the voice only will get stronger if everybody does something about it. And I think it's like the, the famous starfish story, right? As in, we couldn't probably save every single starfish on that beach, but it mattered to that one starfish that we picked up and put into the sea. So I guess every single tweet, every single letter, every single voice matters, and people should uh, speak up for animals. Absolutely. In fact, animals don't have voices, and perhaps that makes it even more necessary for people to speak up. And I mean, even if this government is receptive, the hope really is that it continues you know as the country progresses right. forward that it isn't just limited to one governance or one uh, party right. in power that uh, you know it's also a mark of civilized society really and you know mahatma gandhi mentioned it right. uh, so it's not it is part of our culture to a great degree as usual, we're running out of time, but uh, we've had, a, I think, a rather uh, wholesome discussion. We've gone beyond just uh, Jali Qatar and also talked about necessary changes needed for the, implement the Prevention of Cruelty, of, uh, animal Act, Cruelty to Animals Act. Gauri, thank you so much for thank joining you. us here in the studio. Jaya, likewise, we really thank appreciate you. your time and the fact that you've uh, raised your voices for those who don't have voices. You were watching this special discussion 
on the way India treats its animals, the kind of uh, voices that need to really wake up and speak up for those who don't have voices in this country. There are many out there. And uh, as Jaya did mention, there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can, of course, use social media, which I think most of us are very good at doing. On that note, we are going to wrap up this discussion. I'm Aisha Sindhu. News and updates continue on the other side of this very short break. Thanks for joining us.